That's okay. The people of the state of Michigan versus Shanda Van Ark, count one, charging open murder involving the death of Timothy Ferguson. We find her guilty of first degree felony murder. Count two, first degree child abuse. We find her guilty of first degree child abuse. All right, thank you. Court will record the verdict for the record, Mr. Johnson. Would you like the jury pulled? Please, Your Honor. All right. <clears throat> All right, juror number two, please rise. Is that your uh, is that your verdict? Yes, sir. Juror number uh, five. No, excuse me, four. Is that your verdict? Two. Okay. And you don't have to say, you can say yes or no. So uh, juror number Actually, this was that was juror number four. Juror number five, is that your verdict? Yes. All right. You can sit down. Juror number six, please rise. Is that your verdict? Yes, sir. All right. Juror number seven, is that your verdict? Yes. All right. Juror number eight, is that your verdict? Yes. Juror number nine, is that your verdict? Yes. Juror number ten, is that your verdict? Yes. Juror number eleven, is that your verdict? Yes, Your Honor. Juror number twelve, is that your verdict? <clears throat> yes. Juror number 13, is that your verdict? Yes. And juror number 14, is that your verdict? Yes. All right. So with that being said, again, the court will record the verdict uh, for the uh, record. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I thank you for your service. This uh, was an incredibly difficult case. Now you know when the attorneys were discussing what the evidence would be, I think you understand what we were talking about. Unfortunately now, uh, it uh, was not for the faint of heart. And certainly those of you who did this, uh, unfortunately, it's unfortunate you that you will not get those images out of your mind. Uh, I won't. Um, but somebody had to do it, and I'm glad that you uh, were willing to do that. You are discharged of service at this time. You are free to talk to anyone you wish about this, or you don't have to talk to anybody if you don't want to, but you're free. The restriction regarding New disease reports, you can look anything you want, you can talk to anyone you want uh, at this point going forward. So again, thank you for your service and you are excused. Mr. Weaver, please rise. So Shonda Vander Ark found guilty of um, all charges. But it's interesting, though, um, they said felony murder. There was an open murder charge, which could have been murder one or murder two. Um, there was also a child abuse charge. Looks like the judge is still speaking. Let's go back into the court. I don't know either, but certainly, um, given the nature of the crime, um, the court is going to revoke bond. Uh, we are going to... Schedule sentencing for January 29th, 2024 at 8.30 a.m. The court's going to refer the matter to state probation for preparation of a pre-sentence report. And again, bond is revoked at this time. Anything else for the record, Mr. Roberts? No, thank you, Ron. Mr. Johnson? No, sir, thank you. Gentlemen, uh, I, I, I can't say enough. You were very professional. I think you did both did an incredibly well, good job. And um, certainly, again, professional. And uh, I certainly appreciate that. We were very efficient, and uh, I think that's important. So thank you very much, uh, and have a good afternoon, have a good uh, night, and have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're adjourned. All right, so once again there, you heard the judge and you heard the verdict by the jury. Uh, first degree felony murder, first degree child abuse. Uh, seeming to skip over the open murder, first degree murder or second degree murder. Get some clarification on that. Sentencing due January 29th, 8.30 a.m. There'll be a pre-sentencing report and 
Shonda decided not to be in the courtroom, didn't want to be in there to hear what was an inevitable verdict. I'm sure she well knew, signed a stipulation, that it was okay that she not be there. The judge didn't feel necessary to compel her because there was no law that said she had to be there, but she will have to be there for sentencing. Judge. Yeah, and you just read my mind on two counts. The first is, you said the other day, Michael, <laughs> listen, I think if she's found guilty of the first degree child abuse, then automatically it's gonna be a felony murder first degree, almost right. automatically not literally, but because that's the underlying felony. And yes. so I feel like maybe they did the first degree child abuse first mm -hmm. and then went from there and said, well, that's the felony, so therefore it's first degree felony. I don't know that, that's just my opinion. The second thing is I feel like it is an injustice. I understand what the judge did. Mm -hmm. I think that was the right thing to do. The fact that she did not have to be there to hear this verdict for Timothy Ferguson really bothers me. Okay. I think she's cheating. I think she should have had to be there and hear it from the jury. Just my opinion. Fair enough. All right. Well, maybe there's something to uh, a little movement for a law in that in that mm, direction. Great if you point. don't have any serious mental uh, or physical problems. All right. Let's bring in Deputy Public Defender Philip Dubé and get his thoughts on this verdict. Philip? Oh, no surprise. You know, it was an uphill battle from day one. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've said it all along. Cops and kids are the most tragic victims. You have a 15-year-old, special needs, profoundly autistic child who was brutally beaten, tormented, and tortured at the hands of his own mother. The evidence was overwhelming and compelling. She did herself no favors by taking the stand. Uh, she was very short-spoken. She was caustic and frankly, a little brisk on the stand with her answers. Uh, I don't know what broke this woman, uh, but, you know, I think we've all heard that expression, you know, nature versus nurture. And God only knows what went on in her own life growing up as a child. Uh, she kind of reminds me with those pigtails of, I don't know if you remember that film, The Bad Seed from the late 50s. It was with Patty McCormick. Uh, the, uh, the protagonist, if you will, or the villain, uh, was a child killer who wore pigtails. And it was unbelievable. Nobody could understand why somebody who was so loved uh, by her parents would go out and kill so many people, including a child. And that's exactly who she reminded me of. It seemed like there was a dearth and a poverty of emotion within her as she testified. And she was clearly out of her league in having to raise a special needs child and did not understand that distinction between reasonable discipline and cruel child abuse. And now the jury has spoken. And maybe it did happen to her. I think it's sentencing. We're going to learn a lot more mm -hmm. yeah. about her upbringing. But having said that, people push back against me, Philip, all the time when we talk about this mm -hmm. and say, hey, I was a victim. Guess what I don't do? I'm not perpetrating crimes against children, although I was the victim. And so I think we really need to be clear that even if she is a survivor of some type of abuse, that does not an abuser make. I mean, it doesn't mean, and this to me was not just maybe she had to eat hot sauce and, and then it was such a planned, obsessive, consistent torturing including looking at the cameras all the time to say, Paul, what are you doing? You weren't watching. Now you have to go give him an ice bath. Now you have to give him three pieces of bread with hot sauce. It was to me so malicious and so, um, so a systematic torture of this child. I just can't put that aside, no matter what you're raised as. No, of course. Uh, but, you know, let's make no mistake about it. There's, there's an old adage in forensics, and they say that uh, a psychopath is born and a sociopath is made. And the real question is, where does she fall on that spectrum? Is she a sociopath or is she a psychopath? And if the clinicians are to be believed that she is, in fact, maybe a sociopath, it suggests that something went on in her life. And there's a whole body of science on this. It's called epigenetics that deals with what goes on in 
a person's environment. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be when you're a child. It could be later on in life. If you notice when she was on the stand, she was constantly deferential to authority with yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. It sounded like she was raised almost like the like the little soldier in the home. And, uh, and now she wanted this child who is completely defenseless to look up to her and behave like the little soldier as well, but of course was incapable because of his own special needs. But she's going where she belongs. She will never see the light of day again, and she will have decades to ponder and think about what she did to that poor kid. Yeah, you know, it was interesting. This case sent me to do some research on, you know, are these types of people born or are they, is it nature versus nurture? And there yeah. really hasn't been any studies to suggest they could isolate any DNA or a particular gene that exists in these types of people. And they just believe that it's really some combination of the DNA yeah. and the genes versus, and as yeah. well as the environment that creates these situations. But what did you make, Philip, of the fact that she didn't want to be there, asked not to be there, signed a stipulation? not to be there no law says she has to be there so the judge said it was okay to go ahead with the verdict without her in the courtroom because I think she knew that the outcome was a foregone conclusion and uh, she just didn't want to behold what this jury had to say uh, and I also think that and it's just my own supposition that after she took the stand there was probably some scuttlebutt at the jail or in the lockup where she was that she came off like an unbelievable buffoon on the stand and uh, sometimes inmates take those words to heart by people who are sort of on the inside of these penal institutions and they try to limit uh, or do some damage control and she just didn't want to face the jury anymore because she knew what was going to happen to her uh, and i will say she does have that right you know, if you deliberately absent yourself from the proceedings, the trial goes on without you. Uh, in California, you have the right to uh, absent yourself uh, from all proceedings except sentencing. Uh, and I believe you even have the right to absent yourself from victim impact if you want. The goal is to have the victims address the court, not the defendant personally. But uh, it sounds like the law may be a little bit different in that jurisdiction. Yeah, I was just going to say that apparently, according to the judge, the law in Michigan says you have to be there to listen mm -hmm. to the victim yeah. impact statements. Yep, yeah. and then the sentencing as well. I mm -hmm. thought I heard him say, yeah, yes, no. you have yeah, to the, be there the for both. Being, yep, yeah, the yeah. whole right. thing. Yep, yeah. the whole shebang, yeah. so to speak. All right, let's listen together. I want to revisit some of the testimony about the text messages between Paul, oh. the older son, and the mother who is now a convicted murderer. We may not have that ready. So let's talk about those text messages because the other thing we know is that she really didn't do a lot of these things herself. Instead, she had Paul do them. Anything in there that suggests to you maybe there's some grounds of appeal for the murder, the first degree felony murder, or does that not concern you at all that she didn't physically do a lot of the acts? I don't think she has to. I think she just has to cause it to occur. You know, so it doesn't have to be physically at her hand, but as the child's caregiver, if she actually directed this behavior, it falls on her. You know, it's almost like a solicitation to kill. If you hire somebody to kill, even though you're not the actual killer, you're going down as the solicitor. You know, the fact that you're going out looking for someone to do that underhanded deed does not immunize you from criminal liability. Uh, and I think we talked about it in the earlier hour that uh, this child went through what's called parentification. And I'm talking about uh, the older brother who testified. Uh, she used this child sort of in a reverse role play to act as the parent, the, the discipliner, if you will, the guardian of this child in her absence to unreasonably discipline the kid and to do these dastardly deeds against the child, even though it was seemingly against his own will, but it was at the behest of the mother. So I hope for this kid's sake that the court doesn't come down too hard on him because I truly believe uh, that the mother was holding sway over him and that he would not have done this otherwise of his own volition. Yeah, I think you're right. So we're going to see what happens in that case as well. But we want to take a break right now because we have just learned a lieutenant that was on this case will be joining us here to talk to us about this verdict. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.